Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Priya Natarajan. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist and on the faculty at Yale in the departments of astronomy and physics. I happen to serve as the current director of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities. And I'm really excited to invite you to this evening's talk. The title of our talk is Mozart Starling, A Story of Art Language and the Human Relationship with the Natural World. Um, before we start, I would first like to say thanks to Richard and Barbara Frankie for their generous support of uh, this program, as well as many other initiatives uh, at Yale. And I would also like to uh, give a thank you to the Connecticut Parrot Society and the Mozart Society of America for spreading the word uh, about today's talk um, and um, you know, opening up this opportunity um, for everyone to listen to uh, Leander's wonderful talk uh, that I'm eagerly um, waiting to hear. And um, to introduce Leander and um, to, um, to talk about uh, budding in general, we have our um, local international expert evolutionary ornithologist, um, uh, Professor Rick Prum, who incidentally was the inaugural and previous director of the Frankie program. Um, Rick, as uh, many of you know, uh, Rick Prum, uh, for those of you who might have read his wonderful books, has done research on diverse topics, including you know, avian phylogenetics, behavior evolution, uh, evolution of aesthetics, all, and most of all, he is an avid birder. So I would like to turn over hosting today's event to Rick oh. and uh, Rick, welcome and thank you so much. Thank you, Priya, and a pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, today visiting with uh, the Frankie program in our uh, new, uh, for our accustomed Zoom state. Uh, uh, first, uh, 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 thanks again to Rich and Barbara Frankie uh, and great to see them here today. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker today. Uh, Lianda Haupt is an award-winning author, naturalist, and eco-philosopher whose writing in multiple books has connected uh, nature and uh, biodiversity to the lives of, uh, everyday lives of people. Um, uh, her previous books include The Urban Bestiary, The, uh, the Encountering of Everyday, wife, uh, everyday Life in the Wild, uh, Crown, uh, Crow Planet, Essential Wisdom for the Urban Wilderness, uh, and Pilgrim of the Great Bird Continent, Importance of Everything and Other Lessons from Darwin's Notebooks, all published by Little Brown. Uh, in the next month, she has a new book coming out, Rooted, Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature, and Spirit with Little Brown. And today, we had the pleasure of hearing uh, from her on her uh, award-winning book in 2017, Mozart's Starling. Uh, so uh, thank you and welcome to the Frankie Program, uh, Lianda. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I want to begin with some gratitude. Thank you to the Frankies for your generosity. I am so happy to be part of this beautiful series. Um, thank you, Professor Natrajan. I'm sure I said your name incorrectly. But, and uh, thank you, Professor Prem, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to Professor Ty Camp for uh, arranging this. We had so many emails back and forth, um, figuring out how things would go. And who else should I thank? I know who, Frederick. Professor Camp's son, Frederick, I hear, started this whole adventure with a thoughtful holiday gift. So well done, Frederick. Thank you. So. And Leanda, you know. I, I forgot to thank Carmen for today's <laughs> talk as well to be featured. So I wanted to say thank you to uh, both you, our wonderful speaker, and our participant, active participant, hopefully, Carmen, who will be there. And um, I also wanted to give a shout out because uh, to Rick's book, uh, which is this uh, one of my absolute favorite books <laughs> as well. So I think for all of you, um, without further ado, um, Leander, please one, take it away. One, one, 
one further delay, if I may, I'm sorry, I was remiss. I should have mentioned, uh, please put your questions during the talk in the chat and we'll monitor the chat. And at the end of the day, we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, so thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, now. Uh, Onward. Okay, yes, ask me anything. All right, I'm gonna pop the share screen on. I wish that we were in person together, of course, it's wonderful to be so, but I, one of the things that this platform gives us the opportunity to do is to gather from places all over the place. And so I wanted to share briefly that I am uh, speaking to you from Seattle in the Pacific Northwest. We are surrounded by the Cascade Mountains and the Olympic Mountains. And this is really a land of mountains and rivers without end, lots of ferns and mosses. And just down the road from my house is a wooded forested path to the Salish Sea. And so I want to say at this point that I live and work on the unceded lands of the Duwamish tribe and the Coast Salish peoples. And I acknowledge with honor and so much gratitude this land and the people who have lived here from time immemorial. If you can see, I'm gonna kind of pop this up because we've got a bird coming through. Um, I'm kind of laughing because the title of this lecture series is the Distinguished Speaker Series. And yet I am coming to you from my kitchen with a starling on my head and pandemic hair. <laughs> and I'm feeling that the whole kitchen situation is very undistinguished. And I promise you that upstairs in my study, there's lots of books high distinguished level. Uh, but the reason that we're here is that uh, Ty Camp and I were talking before this series about whether or not Carmen could join for the Q&A afterwards. And I said, you know, she's welcome to join the talk and that would be fun, but she has a mind of her own. And there's no guaranteeing that if we just open the door of her aviary for the Q&A that she'll come out then. So I decided, we, we decided together to just have the door of her aviary open. It's, it's really close by here. This is her uh, most comfortable room. So she might be flying in and out. And I think we might just be a little bit light on our feet. And I might talk about, um, Starling natural history, not necessarily in the order that I had planned it, just so that we can take advantage of having the bird here. So um, I usually start by doing a little poll and I'm not gonna do the Zoom poll. I just would like you all to humor me. And from wherever you are, if you are a person who feels that you could with maybe 95% accuracy, identify a starling when you see one, please raise your hand. Okay. Lots, lots of hands and not, not all the hands just as to be expected. So I will tell you that if you did raise your hand, you are really in the upper, just few percent strata of people in this country. Most people do not know um, if they know anything about birds at all. They, what they know about starlings is that we are supposed to dislike them, but very few people can identify them. Many people think that they are crows, baby crows, conflating smallness with babiness as uh, people often do, or blackbirds generally. I was speaking with a very illustrious uh, person in the opera world when I was researching this book and he, we were sitting at a coffee shop in Seattle where he has lived for two decades. And we're, he knew about that Mozart had a starling and we were talking a, a, a lot about that. And he finally came to a point in the conversation where he leaned over and he said, but you know, I've never seen a starling. And I thought, oh my goodness. So I said, you know, let's maestro just lean over this way into the, um, to the, uh, and look at the wire above the, above the coffee shop and there are four starlings sitting there. And he just laughed. I said, you're walking under them every single day of your life. A question that I'm often asked is why I wrote this book. And it's a, it's a question that every author gets. And um, it's, most, it's more fitting for me with this book because I am an ecologically minded person. I'm a nature writer. I'm a student of bird life. And if there's one thing that people know about 
starlings is that they are the most despised bird in North America for people that know anything about conservation and ornithology. And um, that's with good reason. They cause $800 million of agricultural damage every year. They are a, um, a non-native species and an invasive species. So they have grown in from when they were introduced here in 1890 from a population of just 80 birds to the 200 million starlings that now blanket North America. And their main ecological issue is that they compete with um, native cavity nesters for that rare resource of cavity nests. So small birds like chickadees, certain woodpeckers, bluebirds, and things like that. So, um, People say, why would I of all people write a book about starlings? And it's something that I never thought I would do. I had already, um, and I apologize that the starling is fluttering through my already bad pandemic hair. So it's kind of a, a funny situation. It's okay, Carmen. Um, so one day I was working on a completely different book at my desk and I looked out the window at the parking strip and what I saw was about, it was autumn. And so the family groups of summer were starting to break down and gather into the larger um, flocks that characterize the, the huge gatherings of starlings um, in autumn and into the winter. And I was looking out there and I thought, dang it, there's 30 starlings. They're scaring away the cute little chickadees that I would rather have out there. So I pounded on the window and the birds, I had a teenager at the time. So I recognized the look that they gave me. It was just, it was complete indifference. They kind of looked up at me like, yeah, we don't care what you think. And so I pounded harder. And this time the starlings lifted from the grass and they turned into the light. And then of course they, they didn't actually leave. They <laughs> went back onto the sidewalk. And, um, but in that moment, the light captured that beautiful iridescence of their feathers. And I thought, you know, I might dislike starlings, but dang, they are so, so pretty. And then I noticed it seemed kind of serendipitous that at the same time, uh, Spotify was on and Mozart's Prague Symphony was playing. And I didn't know at the time that that was a symphony that he composed during the time that he lived with a starling. Uh, but I did sort of have that sense of things coming together. And I re remembered in that moment, the story that I'd heard over and over again, and even had written about just briefly in earlier books that Mozart had a pet starling. And I sat there contemplating that kind of dissonance, you know, that here in, um, here is this composer that we consider to be one of the most sublime voices in the Western cl classical canon. And he had as a muse and a companion, this most despised of birds. <laughs> And I should point out that uh, that in Europe, where Mozart is from, um, starlings are native birds, and so they don't have the reputation that they have here. Um, so I sat there kind of dwelling in that complicated dissonance, and I just went down the rabbit hole of exploring the story. And the thing that I had to start with was, you know, was it even true? Because there are so many apocryphal stories about composers. There's that idea that Beethoven cut the legs off of his piano because he was deaf and he could sit on the floor and hear the, um, the tremblings of, of movement or vibrations of the piano while he played. And that is very, very likely an untrue story. And I thought, gosh, maybe I've been misled by this Mozart Starling story. But it turns out that it is true. Did a little research and found out that this is pretty much the way it went. In April of 1784, Mozart was living in Vienna and he just finished a new concerto. It was the beautiful concerto in G major. And he was not very good at keeping records, but one thing that he did keep really good track of was his finished music. So he wrote in his, you know, in his um, composition diary that he had completed this concerto. It was K. 453, the 453rd finished piece that he had written at age 24. <laughs> Makes me feel kind of lazy. And there were hundreds of others of you know smaller, lesser compositions that he didn't think worthy of making it into the diary. So anyway, April 1784, 
wrote the concerto. He had a fair copy of it made to send to his father, Leopold, the great violinist and violin pedagogue who was living in Salzburg about 250 um, miles away. So by kind of rough carriage road. So he had that sent to his father along with a letter that said, you know, father, I would love your opinion about this. He always valued Leopold's good opinion. Uh, but he said, please be very careful with it. Don't let it, don't let anyone see it. Mozart was always a little bit paranoid that his work was going to be stolen or copied or imitated by a lesser composer. And not without reason, this happened sometimes. So this is all in April, sent it to his father. And in May, he got confirmation that Leopold in Salzburg had received it. This composition was slated to be performed in June in Vienna. So April, it's finished. June, it's going to be performed. In the middle, in May, May 26th of 1784, Mozart went into a bird shop and he lived in the Graben area of uh, that kind of fashionable shopping district of Vienna then and now. And so he went down downstairs from his apartments and he was walking the street. He walked into a bird vendor's shop and he bought a starling for three kreutzer. And the starling was singing the motif from the concerto, from Allegretto movement of the concerto in G. So we know this because although I said that um, Mozart is a terrible record keeper, he did for a while keep a small expense notebook where he wrote down everything that he ever bought. And it's kind of funny, I, it, it's anomalous because it wasn't something that he would normally do. He was married to Constanza Weber, Mozart, um, Mozart who um, was very good at home economics. She had to be because their economic uh, finances were in such disarray. So in my imagination, it was her, Constanza, that gave the notebook to Mozart with the admonition, you know, honey, I want you to write down every single thing that you buy every day and then show it to me at the end of the week and we'll talk. So Mozart was really good about that. And he wrote down three kreutzer for the bird and right underneath it, he wrote down what he heard. So this is Mozart at, um, a couple of years before this. This is Mozart at about 22 years old. He was 24 when he got the bird. And this is what he heard. So what this slide says, if you're not musical, don't worry. Um, but it shows the line of the motif that the starling was singing. And it shows it the way that Mozart wrote it and then the way the starling sang it. So the starling made a couple of changes. <laughs> It, if you're not musical, don't worry. Um, but the there's this little um, arch with the dot under it. That's a fermata, a long pause. And then you'll also see that the bird sharped the G's, which sounds absolutely terrible, but it's exactly the sort of thing that a starling would do. So I'm going to play this for you. And this is just me plunking it on the piano in the living room. Um, and if you listen carefully, you'll be able to hear Carmen from way over here in the kind of the mud room where her aviary is singing in the background. So listen for the changes. Listen carefully to the first line. The starling does not sing the grace notes, um, but there you go. Hope you could hear Carmen in the background there. Um, so a lot of most people, most biographers of Mozart do not mention the starling at all because it takes some sleuthing to get to the bottom of the story. You have to look at diaries, notebooks, letters from visitors and from Mozart himself and other ephemera. Uh, but when people do mention the starling and there's a lot of misinformation about what the starling could sing and what the starling couldn't sing, um, when they come to the idea that Mozart heard the starling mimicking his motif, 
that he must have been furious. So starlings are gifted mimics. So it wasn't really strange that a starling could do this. And I will talk about that more about that in a little bit. Um, people thought he must have been furious because he really was paranoid that that people were going to copy and imitate his music. And here somehow it had gotten in the world enough that a bird, the starling, a good mimic could learn to mimic it. But the information that we have from Mozart himself in the little notebook that he kept was the record that he bought, the bird, these two lines that he copied. And we have Mozart had absolutely perfect pitch. So we know that his version of the Starling song was exactly right. And then underneath that, instead of some exclamation of fury, he wrote, and I, forgive me, I do not speak German, but the line is das was schön. That was wonderful. So, so we have the real Carmen here and you guys will have to tell me since I can't see myself how, um, if I'm situated well enough that you guys can, y'all can see her. Is this all right? Yep, you're fine. Okay, good. So as you can see, um, Carmen looks a little bit different than the young bird she was in that photograph. And one of the questions that uh, people often ask is how they think that I, I talk about this wonderful mystery of Mozart coming to have the starling and um, it's a multi-layered mystery. And one of the questions um, that people ask me most is how did a starling learn to sing this motif? And how is really not that much of a mystery. Starlings are gifted mimics. And in this country, especially in North America where starlings are so despised, People bother to learn very little about them, but they are better mimics than the corvids, the crows and jays and ravens. And they are on par with some parrots. So it depends on the starling and it depends on the parrot, <laughs> but um, they're very capable mimics and they mimic environmental sounds, um, other birds, animals, music, and the human voice and many other things. So the real, issue is when the starling learned Mozart's concerto, because as I said, he finished it in April. It wasn't supposed to be out until June. So we don't know if, Star if Mozart visited the shop and taught it, the bird, the motif himself when he was whistling along as he often did, or whether you know, he heard Mozart practicing out the window and from his apartments above, or there are all kinds of other possibilities of the way that the starling could have learned it. And in most, whenever, you know, you'll, you'll read about this in program notes when you go to the symphony and hear this concerto performed. And I am absolutely shocked at how often the course of events described are absolutely impossible. <laughs> or people will say, learned people will say in program notes that the starling could sing the whole concerto, which even for a starling is too much, or that the starling sang a couple of notes flat, which, you know, no respectable starling would sing flat. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I enjoyed doing was all the research that it really came to narrow down the possibilities of what could have actually happened. Um, so I really went down the rabbit hole of exploring the relationship with Mozart and his starling. I read every scientific paper that I could find in any language that I could read, which is English. So I <laughs> um, read all of the scientific literature. I put my binoculars around my neck and went out into the urban wilds and studied uh, starlings extensively in the field. I traveled to Vienna and spent um, days in the apartments where Mozart lived with his starling to kind of imagine how their life would have gone uh, together there. And I realized that the, there was one thing that was missing in all of this research that I really needed to do in order to understand how Mozart lived with, with a starling. And that was to take a drastic step and live with a starling myself. <laughs> so let me first say that it is absolutely illegal to harm, touch, even glance sideways at any nest, 
nestlings or most birds in North America. So it's completely illegal to have a nestling bird of most kinds. Most birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Starlings are an exception in being a non-native bird and an invasive bird. They are not protected by the Treaty Act or Fish and Wildlife. And we are not only allowed, but actually encouraged by federal and local fish and wildlife departments to remove starling nests and eggs and even nestlings in any way that we can. So I personally agree that we should find ways to limit starling nests and eggs, but I personally ethically believe that after the nestlings are hatched is not the time to remove the nestlings. I did, however, learn when I was on, on the hunt for a starling for my research that um, there was a nest in a Seattle park, not far from my home, that was going to be removed by the Fish and Wildlife or the um, state city parks department. And I had an in insider in the parks who knew the research that I was working on. And he told me about it. And I said, you know, those starlings have actually hatched already because I've been studying all the starlings in the area. And he said, well, you know, no one cares. They're just starlings. So he said, it's going to happen tonight. <laughs> you don't have that much time. So um, as with a lot of so-called wildlife control, um, when animals are removed by wildlife or killed by um, wildlife, um, fish and wildlife organizations or city parks department, they do it at night so that people uh, don't get upset. So I told my husband that it was our one chance to get a starling and he was a little bit dubious about it, but we went up to the park. It was a harrowing adventure that involved us sneaking into this boy's bathroom at a park, borrowing the park's garbage can, climb, climbing on top of it. Starlings are cavity nesters and they like to nest far enough back that a raccoon's paw cannot reach them. And in this case, the starlings were way, way back in the eaves of this kind of slightly open air bathroom. So I climbed up there and I couldn't reach. And my husband climbed up there with his long arm and he could just, we could feel the heat of the starling nestlings, but we couldn't quite reach them. And finally with me sort of leaning on this garbage can against the wall to keep it from falling out from under my poor husband. So he wouldn't end up just dangling by his arm from this bat boy's bathroom ceiling. Um, finally, he grasped a starling chick and he dropped it in my hands and the chick was only a few days old. And I looked at this little bird and I thought, oh my goodness, this bird is so sickly. She was wheezing. She had ectoparasites that I could literally see crawling all over her. And she, she just didn't see, she seemed highly ephemeral. <laughs> And I said, honey, you know, it would be better if we had two, they could keep each other warm. And the glare I got from my, my husband in that moment with him standing there with his bruised arm was just, it was priceless. But it also told me that we were going to have just the one starling, Carmen. So um, what I didn't realize is that I have a background in rehabilitation of birds, especially raptors, but at the Raptor Center in Vermont, people would bring in all kinds of birds. And so I'd raised starlings before and many other young birds, but um, I didn't realize that raising one just from a few days to adulthood would take over my life. And this is a video and we were testing it before and we found out that it's just not, it's not playing very well. It's a little bit glitchy, but this is how she looked uh, from my writing desk. So I would sit every day writing this book, Mozart's Starling. My laptop was in the middle of my desk to the right was this little tiny Tupperware with this kind of frightful getting uglier by the day <laughs> baby Starling and hungrier as well, who needed feeding every 20 minutes from dawn to dusk. And on the other side, of my computer, there was often Delilah the cat. And it was really funny. Delilah knew that she wasn't supposed to eat the bird, but she would ever so slightly reach over with her paw. And I'd say, Delilah, nope. And she'd pull it back and just pretend to be licking herself. Um, and I'm just gonna 
put this on just for a second and see if you can get a sense of it. And I'm not going to leave it on for the whole time because I know it's not really going to work, but I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed and see if you can get a little bit of a vibe from my end. So I'm sorry if that didn't look good for you, but it's um, just a kind of a fun little image of the cheeping bird that was um, my constant company. What was really funny about this and what I didn't expect was how limiting this would be to my um, movement. I had to be, I did have to feed her every 20 minutes and keep her a certain temperature. I basically couldn't leave the house if I went for a walk and I was back. It took me, you know, 22 minutes instead of 20, I would walk inside and I would hear this incredible, um, churring sound. There's this very loud churring sound that, uh, young starlings make, they outgrow it in a couple of months, but, uh, that would, it would just be pouring over the whole house and I would brush up to feed her. And one time I thought, you know, I'm tired of being stranded and I need groceries. And so I packed her up in her box and I packed her up with the food and I, just went to the nearest grocery store. And by the time I got there, she was so cold because she needs to be about 85 degrees. I had a lamp for her at home. And so what I had to do was I literally took her and put her in my bra, <laughs> ran in, got my milk and bread, came out again and thought, all right, I'm never doing this again. And you can see th th this little stirring stick here. I in the, um, in the slide. One of the things that's interesting about keeping a baby starling is that although we are allowed to do anything that we want to starlings, kill and maim them, we are not legally allowed to take them home and raise them in our living rooms. They don't want people having pet starlings that they might propagate. So I was already a minor felon in terms of taking the bird, but then I went, ran into Starbucks and stole a whole handful of those little stirring sticks to feed her with. So my rap sheet was just getting really long at this point. And even though she was so sickly and wheezing with a lot of care, Carmen grew very fat. She did get uglier before she got cuter. We couldn't tell for certain whether she was a male or female at this point. Um, so we chose the name Carmen, which could be used for males or females. I love this juvenile plumage. They have this very white chin that allows them to be found from below, which we discovered when Carmen flew out the kitchen window one day and she got lost and we found her high, high in a fir tree outside our home, Mo partly by the contact call that she was making, but partly by the whiteness of her chin. So this is a little kind of family photo album. Quickly, Carmen became um, so at home among us. And I don't know if she thinks that we are starlings or that she's and we're part of her flock or she's part of our human family. Um, either way, she is very much at home. And so this is kind of a little album of how things look at home. This is a look at a plumage that we rarely see because the birds only keep it for a couple of weeks. And it's a time when they are cared for and still pretty hidden by their parents. So I like throwing this in for bird people. Claire, my daughter is reading Jane Eyre and Carmen loved to sit on her shoulder and kind of snuggle under her hair while she was reading. And here she is all grown into her beautiful teenage juvenile plumage. So this is what it looked like and what it often looks like for me to be researching or writing on any given day. Carmen does like to be up, um, up with me. And the reason that I, I didn't take her up into my study today is that sometimes she decides all of a sudden that she's anxious up there and wants to leave. And I didn't want to interrupt our talk. Um, but as you can see, I, I'm just noticing in this photo, there's a lot of books reflected in the wind and the um, window. So you can see that it actually is very distinguished up there. <laughs> anyway, Carmen would sit on my shoulder and she makes every single task I do take twice as long as it normally would. Um, she, she steals my post-its. She gets into all kinds of trouble. She sits on my hands while I'm trying to type and just creates all kinds of a ruckus. But 
does like to be with me no matter what I'm doing. She sends messages that I'm not ready to send. She likes Facebook posts that I do not like. Um, it's been a little bit of a problem. But all of that, I think, looks really kind of tranquil. Like it's fun having a starling around, and it is. But what it doesn't show is the background symphony of starling sound that we live with in our home. So I, I hope that this works. I want to talk a little bit about what you're going to hear. Um, so in this video, Carmen has two different kinds of vocalizations. One is um, the array of starling, just typical starling vocalizations. And for people who are interested in birds and ornithology, it Starlings are a songbird and it is typical for most species that the male of the species is the singer and sings the, I mean, males and females both have many vocalizations, but it's the male that typically sings the species, what is recognized as a species song in the breeding season for many reasons, in part to attract a mate, to create and defend a territory and other things. Um, for a few birds and starlings are among them, Females also sing. So male and female starlings sing year round. They don't just use their like chatty vo vocalizations. They use actual song year round. It becomes more uh, frequent and more animated for male birds at, during the breeding season. And it is also during the breeding season that female starlings fall absolutely silent on their nests. The first time this happened with, with Carmen, I thought that she was depressed or that there was, I, I was doing something wrong, but I've learned that she does it seasonally. And um, so it is little wonder that it was only recently, I mean, it was a little bit over 10 years ago that we finally figured out that female starlings also sing. So in this little clip, you'll hear starling vocalizations, but mixed in, you'll hear some of that mimicry that characterizes the talents, the mimicry talents of the starling. And um, what's in here? So you're gonna hear, cause it, it's a little, it, it's all a little bit whistly, but you'll hear the whir of the coffee grinder. You'll hear the creak of our oak floor. Once Carmen, Carmen learns new sounds all of the time, even though she's almost seven years old, Starlings, again, this is different for starlings from other songbirds. Most songbirds usually use the, learn their species song and other vocalizations within the first year or so of their life. Um, and then that's it. But starlings, like some other mimics are lifelong learners. So they will actually mimic novel sounds and continue learn, learning throughout their lives. And Carmen's working on a new sound now. I'm trying to figure out what it is. And this happens a lot. If she's not imitating or mimicking a, voc a human vocalization or a piece of music, it'll be some environmental sound and I cannot figure it out. And so one of those was this song, the sound where she'd go ee. And I thought, what is going on? And finally I stepped outside um, just over the threshold of where she usually hangs out. And I stepped on our old work wood oak floor and it creaked in just that same way. Eee! I thought she's just mimicking the place that I step every day. Also in here in quick succession, you'll hear a meow, a high honey and a kissy sound like that, that you used to call animals and also a come here honey. So I'll play it. I hope that you'll be able to hear it and I'll kind of point out the sounds as they come. That was coffee grinder. What? Well, you're, you're going to have to do remote school for. is responding to that.
So I hope people could hear that, okay? So um, Carmen uses her mimicry in three different ways that I have noticed. One of them is that she just mixes it in like she did here. So she's making a lot of typical starling noises and she throws her some of her favorite mimic sounds inside. She also does it randomly. So I will be sitting in the living room by myself, say, and she'll be in her aviary. She goes into her aviary for the evening. We like to leave it open so she can get as much freedom of, of flight as possible. But in the evening, she starts sort of bonking around. So we make sure she's safe inside when dusk falls. But I will be in the living room and I'll hear her say, just from the next room, come here, honey. And I'll sit there going, am I supposed to go there? <laughs> It's, it's sort of, it's a little bit haunting and kind of super interesting. Um, but the other way is participatory. And I'm sorry, I don't have this slide for you. It was a, um, I don't know what happened, but I'll at least tell you the story. So every morning when I come downstairs, I'm usually the first one awake, I'll come downstairs and Carmen will look at me. And the first thing that she'll say in this hushed whispered voice is, hi, Carmen, because that's what she usually hears when I come down the stairs, first thing. And then our big cat Delilah will come down the stairs and Carmen will look at Delilah. And before Delilah says anything, Carmen says, meow. And then when I go and I pick up the jar of coffee beans to make the coffee, but before I start the coffee grinder, she says, Arr! And then, and this is the video I hope to show you, um, when I open and close the door of the microwave, but before I press the buttons, she'll say beep, beep, beep. And it is pitch perfect. Like we literally cannot tell them apart. We cannot tell the microwave from Carmen. And so it took me months of living with a starling who had this wonderful aural attunement to recognize something that is little understood and little studied or discussed in the literature. And that is that Carmen Starling vocalizations. Now I have no idea what's going on with my hair after all that Starling visitation. <laughs> um, Starling's aural involvement with their environment is not only participatory, but it is anticipatory. So she is always in the world waiting, hourly attuned to what is going on and ready to participate by proclaiming the sound that is about to happen. And this is, I just think the most magnificent knowledge. And it took me so long to figure it out. And then to realize, you know, my first thought was, wow, I have a really smart starling in my house. <laughs> but of course, it's not just this starling. It is a capacity of all starlings to live with this wild aural attunement. And so when I step through the door, it makes me realize just from learning from this little bird, makes me realize that we live within this infinity of consciousness, conscience, <laughs> Consciousness. Okay, I'm not even consciousnesses. There we go. An infinity of intelligences that is beyond our knowing and even our imagining. And it makes the world seem so full of wonder. I think of Emerson's quote We lie in the lap of an immense intelligence. And so um, it's, you know, I, I just think it's one of the most wonderful things I've learned from living with a starling. And when I think about it, I know that we have ecological issues with the starling, but I think, you know, this, what we are learning from their song and their vocalizations is so magnificent. What could be wrong? Do, 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 do. I don't know if you can see, I can't see myself. Enter Noam Chomsky. Shout out to Steve Harrington, who has a company in Portland called Just Say Gnome. He read my book and he learned that I borrowed the statue of Garden Gnome Chomsky from a friend and he sent me my own. So very happy. 
So back in the 1950s, this very bright young linguist, Noam Chomsky, was hanging out at MIT, thinking a lot about what makes human language unique. And you have to remember that in the 50s, behaviorism was very popular and B.F. Skinner had the prominent theory about how children learn language. And he felt that it was through rewards. So, you know, if a kid says something right, the mom give them a pat on the head or a cupcake or something, and they get all of this positive reinforcement. And Noam Chomsky thought, and rightly, that that was nonsense. He came up over years with a very different idea that we have a rule-based, innate rule-based way of coming to apprehend and utilize language. He called it universal grammar. And one of the most important aspects of this universal grammar or rules was a certain kind of syntax. So as humans, there's two different ways that we add information and complexity to our sentences. One of them is by um, just adding onto it, adding onto the end of the sentence, right? So say we have a sentence like Mozart played the violin. We could add to it by saying Mozart played the violin and had a pet bird. Mozart played the violin and had a pet bird who liked to sit on his shoulder. And we could keep doing that forever. And for some weird reason, the metaphor that I used in the book was like a rat growing a longer tail. And for some other weird reason, I didn't edit it out. <laughs> I still use that metaphor. So the rat's tail is growing longer and longer, adding onto it brick by brick, track by track. But the other way that humans complexify our sentences is from the inside out through a syntactical device called recursion. So when we say, instead of saying Mozart played the violin and had a pet starling, we could say Mozart who played the violin had a pet starling. Mozart who played the violin and enjoyed singing had a pet starling. And we could grow that sentence from within over and over again forever. So instead of being like the rat with a tail, it's our sentences become like peonies, these layered blossoming from within. And we see recursion sometimes in music as well, including the music of Mozart. But this became very important for Noam Chomsky, who decided that it was, it was a cornerstone of his universal grammar that all humans and only humans recognize recursive, recursivity in the way that we use our language. So anthropologists are actually busy debunking the first part of that, that all humans recognize um, recursion. But the really interesting thing is that starlings are the first animal to prove the second part of Chomsky's theory incorrect. So there is a um, neuropsychologist, Tim Gentner at the University um, UC San Diego. And he did some studies where he took startling sounding voices and little bits of them, and he made them into patterns. He made them into linear patterns like A, A, B, B. And then he made them into recursive patterns where he'd stick a different pattern in the middle of this linear pattern. And what he found was that all it, though it took some doing, it took many of the starlings, thousands of, of try, tries listening, that they could ultimately recognize recursive patterns. So when Noam Chomsky heard this research, he was furious. <laughs> he woke from his dogmatic slumbers and he rushed to critique the study. And he denounced the starlings behavior as being nothing more than memorizing or counting rattles. He said that it was basically like party tricks. And actually the things that he was suggesting the starlings were doing were very complex behaviors for a bird like a starling, but he was unwilling to entertain the idea that um, they were recognizing recursion. And so later Tim Gentner took great pains to make his studies more complexified and make the patterns more difficult so that there was really no way to claim that the starlings were just acting from memory or counting. So, um, yeah, you really have to side with the starling science on that, which is quite fascinating. So linguistics were one of the 
ways, one of the main ways that I ended up, to my surprise, I didn't expect to go down the path of linguistics. By the way, I found myself on the screen here, so thank you. Um, it's the way that we're arranged. Um, did not expect to go down the path of linguistics. And we can talk more about that if you want to in the Q&A. There's just so much fun stuff there uh, about the anthropological dimension as well. I did expect to go into music. And one of the things that surprised me was I discovered the work of a very well-known neurophysicist. And she said the most remarkable thing. She said, I wanna get the quote right, right, that only humans have the capacity to engage with music. Only humans have the capacity to engage with music. And I read that aloud at our dinner table one night and everyone just cracked up because <laughs> we live with a starling who is, who cannot, we cannot have music going on in the house without her reacting wildly. And um, I had this great fantasy when Carmen came to the house. I didn't um, I didn't want to teach her any particular vocalization. I just wanted to see how her mimicry and vocal learning would unfold in the uh, general household round of our daily life. But I did have one exception and that is that, I'm so sorry, I was just making sure she's not bathing in the cat water, which is bad for her. Um, she's bathing in some other water that she's not allowed to be in, but it is, it, it, it's safe at least. So the exception was that I was hoping she would learn to sing or mimic the, um, the line that Mozart Sterling sang the, from his allegretto from the concerto in G major. So I put it on loop on my phone and I played it for her over and over again while she was growing up and she had no interest whatsoever and here I'm thinking it would be, you know, the perfect conclusion to the book and she'd be famous and Oprah would come, but she just doesn't give it a glance. But other music, she leaps to life like an opera hero when she hears it. And she doesn't like much of Mozart at all. She does like uh, the theme of Papageno, this very bird-like character from the magic flute that I believe to be inspired in some part by Mozart's time with his starling. She also likes uh, one of his uh, divertimals, a musical joke <laughs> that he wrote during the time that she lived with or that his Sterling lived with him as well. And the famous ornitholo ornithologist Baptista and an ethologist Meredith West sort of over um, played the musical joke overlain with the Starling vocalizations and definitely found the vocal imprint of the Starling on this piece of Mozart's that has for so long been um, despised by musicians everywhere because it makes them sound so discordant and like they don't know what they're doing. But it seems like Mozart knew exactly what he was doing. He was composing a kind of musical elegy for his bird. Anyway, other than this couple of exceptions, Carmen unfortunately has little interest in Mozart, but she loves Bach and she loves bluegrass. <laughs> And she was fortunate with Bach because Claire, uh, my daughter, is a fine cellist. And so we had the um, unaccompanied cello suites going on in the house a lot. And Carmen would sing along with them. And my husband happens to be a bluegrass fan. And this is how we discovered Carmen's love of bluegrass. And she even has a favorite band, Green Sky Bluegrass. And I think it's because they have a really strong mandolin line. And the mandolin lies within, you know, her vocal, um, her natural sort of vocal range. So... I tried this out before um, we all gathered here with the panelists and it seemed a little bit loud and distorted, but I'm going to give it a try because I will tell you that it also sounds kind of loud and distorted from our home. We'll have bluegrass playing and then Carmen will be singing along. So if you want to ask, you know, why I, what I mean when I disbelieve the sense that only humans can be engaged with music. I will show you that, uh, what it looks like when Carmen is engaged with music.
So I hope that worked. Here's my. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't make you listen to that anymore. <laughs> I hope you could get a sense of that. So, um, oh wow, I do really have starling hair. <laughs> All right. What I love when I listen to Carmen engaging with music is thinking about her interaction or um, Mozart's bird's interaction with his family. And I actually believe his starling to be male. So even though I said that males and females are both really gifted mimics, a just really sing the it, males are have a, a little bit of an edge on that. It seems that females might be able to um, apprehend complexity in sound and vocalizations better than male starlings can, but males can mimic a little bit better than females. And so because Mozart's bird was such a gifted mimic and could uh, mimic part of this concerto, I believe him to be a male. And plus it was easier for me to write to have a male starling and a female starling. So I love thinking of Mozart with his starling in his home. Um, uh, this is before he was married, um, Mozart with his sister, Nanural, that's his mother, Anna Maria in the back who has passed and his father, Leopold. And it, this is getting long. So I'm going to just say a couple, couple more things. Anna Maria died, um, when Mozart was 21 in Paris and Leopold died while Mozart had his starling and he lived in Vienna while Leopold was living in Salzburg. Um, Leopold died in 1787. He was 62 years old, which was a pretty good age for the time. And at the time, Mozart didn't attend the funeral and much was made of this and, and still is by biographers that it shows that, you know, Leopold was very kind of authoritarian and controlling and officious with Mozart which he was, but there was also, when you read their letters, just so much love between them. At the time that Leopold died, Mozart um, had young children in the house. Constanza was sick with a septic leg and their financial situation was terrible. And by the standards of the day, a funeral was very expensive. So if Mozart went and created a memorial service for his father in Salzburg, remember 250 miles away, um, he would have had to lay out for the expenses of the funeral and even hire mourners, which is something they did at the time. So it wasn't that Mozart didn't go or didn't want to go to Leopold's funeral, in my opinion. It's that he simply could not go. But two months after um, Leopold died, the starling died. And from his garden in Vienna, Mozart created a... a um, grand and formal funeral. So he buried the bird in the garden. He invited friends to wear formal morning clothes and play music. And he even wrote an elegy for the bird. And when people talk about this, this contrast in Mozart not attending his father's funeral and then creating this formal funeral for his bird, uh, most people, most biographers don't mention it again, but those that do posit two different theories. One is that it was simply a joke <laughs> that it, it, you know, it was over the top. Mozart was, you know, always a prankster and it would appeal to his sense of humor to, uh, to create a formal funeral for a bird. And the other is that it was, you know, a way of grieving his father, that this is a little bit of pop psychoanalysis that people are doing that sort of the vessel of the funeral, um, in any form offered a channel for the grief that he wasn't able to offer in person to his father. And I honestly believe that both of those things make sense. Certainly a bird funeral would play to Mozart's wonderful sense of the absurd, but, um, and having a funeral could be a container for his grief. But there's a third option that biographers never mention, but that anyone living with a starling could not help but realize. And that is that, it was just sincere. Mozart loved his starling. Here was a bird that like him was uh, a good mimic, <laughs> musical, mischievous, intelligent, and friendly. And he lost this bird during a time when he was in financial distress. 
He lost a child. He lost his father. He was working very hard. At the time his dad died, he was writing Don Giovanni. And here is this musical, cheerful presence with him during all of this. It was a sincere loss for him. And he wrote an elegy, and I'm going to read it to you because it's wonderful. This is Marcia Davenport's um, 1932 translation. A little fool lies here whom I held dear, a starling in the prime of his brief time, whose doom it was to drain death's bitter pain. Thinking of this, my heart is riven apart. A reader shed a tear, and you also hear. He was not naughty, quite, which is a line I love, because that's what I think of Carmen. She's not naughty, quite, but gay and bright, and under all his brag, a foolish wag. This no one can gainsay, and I will lay that he is now on high, and from the sky praises me without pay in his friendly way. Yet unaware that death has choked his breath, and thoughtless of the one whose rhyme is thus well done. I visited Mozart's grave. No one knows exactly where he's buried, but um, because it's getting late, I think I'm just gonna kind of move on. This is his, his grave in, in Vienna. It's at this beautiful, tangled, ancient, kind of haunted cemetery outside of town. And there used to be a really big memorial there out of granite with the sort of the muse and contemplation. And they took that memorial in the late 1800s and they moved it to the new Vienna Municipal City Cemetery, other side of town. And so all kinds of Mozart pilgrims go and they think that big memorial that it was sort of created to be this garden of dead musicians. Um, Schumann is buried there, Salieri, Beethoven, and then they added this a memorial statue of Mozart. You have to read the fine print to find out that Mozart's actually there, um, not there. But in the actual graveyard where he is, um, he was buried in a common grave, which was the practice of the time. And so they didn't put grave markers in the exact place. And so this is in the approximate place. And when I was there, you can't really tell that jungly tangle, um, the sense of oldness and the hauntedness that enchants this cemetery. But one of the things that really struck me was I kind of leaned down and looked up at this cherub and I expected him to be, you know, contemplating some sort of, you know, the music of the spears and a sense of the spirit of Mozart. But all I really got was this look of, like, oh my gosh, I'm here forever. And he's not even buried here. <laughs> it just made me laugh. There are now 200 million starlings in North America. And ecologically, they are, you know, somewhat disastrous in certain ways. But individually, they have these bright minds, these shining feathers, this lovely, unique consciousness that is so instructive. You know, I think it makes us aware when we walk in the world that we are so deeply interconnected to um, the, all of the kindred of all of the more than human world. Um, and so I'm going to just finish with one little sentence from the book and I'll let us keep watching this murmuration. We can talk about how murmurations work in the Q and A if y'all want to. So it is in reciprocity to this idea of wonder and complexity that we discover what draws us and along with it, our originality, our creativity, our soulness, our gladness, our art. Mozart found inspiration in the presence of a common bird. For us too, the song of the world so often rises in places we had not thought to look. So I'm going to end with Mozart and the starling there for the moment. I'll try to invite Carmen back. I've got her favorite applesauce. We'll try to draw her over, but I'm going to just briefly say, and I apologize for this, but 
I have a book coming out next week and I am basically under contractual <laughs> obligation to mention it whenever I can. Uh, my publicist wanted something of me this afternoon and I said, I can't, I, you know, I can't deal with that. I'm preparing for this lecture. And she said, well, make sure you mention your book. And I'm slightly frightened of her. So I'm mentioning my book, Rooted Life at the Crossroads of Science, Nature and Spirit is available next week. I hope that you'll stay in touch. That's my personal um, oh, my first, I thought I had my email address on there. It's just lyandahaupt at gmail.com. Please feel free to contact me and follow along on any of the, um, socials. All right. I'd be delighted to stay in touch. So I'm going to pop off the stop share screen. Oh, great. Thank you very much. What a lovely talk. And say that, um, I just want to say thank you. I, I know this is a really platform i'm a really conversational um speaker yeah, well, so well, right now is not, right now is the fun part because from here on in it's going to be it's going to be real easy uh the vast majority of your videos and sounds were were perfectly fine so especially okay, the some of the videos that were uh, that were challenging before so uh okay. yeah i i just want to reflect that i think um anyone who has experienced uh, uh, uh a, a bird as a pet or a domesticated bird understands the kind of uh, way that uh, it connects people to the, uh, the intelligence of birds, the person personality of birds in a unique way. That, and uh, so I think you're, you're exactly right. This, uh, the avian intelligences, <laughs> uh, plural, is, a, is a, a big part. And, and I don't think anybody who also had a pet bird could, um, could doubt that, um, Mozart was sincere and not joking in his uh, celebration of the life of his pet starling. That was uh, uh, that was it. so. We have lots of uh, comments in the and questions in the in the uh, great. In the feed. And I just remind for those of you who raise your hand, if you can put your questions in the chat, then that will help us. And I think I'll just start with some of the questions I've been reviewing it and. and uh, uh, Landa, if you want to field or if you need any, any, if you have any, if you want to have a conversation about any of these, I'd be glad to help out. So the first comes from Jane McCall Politi, who asks, uh, do starlings pass on their uh, linguistic abilities to their, to their offspring, to their children? Right. Well, pass on is an interesting, you know, phrase. So they, it, it, it it's unlikely that they pass it on genetically, but they do teach their offspring some of their unique phrases. So starlings have a lot of complex vocalizations that people hearing them think that they're, it's just wild craziness. But when you study them, you find that there's an order to it. But part of that order is in every starling song, it starts with a whistle and then moves on to, there's this little, you know, some, uh, some long whistles and a crescendo and some rattles. There's this section for personal repertoire. So they will throw in sounds that they favor that they've learned, that they've mimicked themselves, and it varies from individual to individual. But we do find that in family groups, males and female partners, mates will start picking up and mimicking back to one another, each individual's own mimic sounds. And then the young will also pick up on the uh, unique individual repertoires of the parents. That said, the young will go on and create their own repertoire and choose their own mimic sounds to add in. So um, there's a lot of sharing and learning, but it doesn't seem to be genetically passed on. Yeah, yeah, great. And so uh, a question from Susan uh, Honius, uh, do, how do starlings compare to the lyrebirds uh, as mimics? Oh, nothing compares to the lyrebirds <laughs> as mimics. Um, We've all seen the David Attenborough footage of the lyre, of the lyre bird doing the, you know, the rewind of the camera. And um, I personally feel that starlings, although they can, they are so gifted and they can pick up so much and they can learn songs and it's incredibly impressive. There's always a whistly birdiness to it. And the things that, uh, Carmen and other starlings mimic that sound, when I say it's pitch perfect and we can't tell them apart, that's something like a, the beep of a microwave. So that is a very kind of birdish sound anyway. But otherwise there's a, a whistly birdiness to it that in the lyrebird, somehow they are 
they're on another plane. So birds, um, you know, humans have larynxes, birds have syrinxes. And so there's a lot of variation in the vocal cords and the vocal apparatus that allow different species to have different um, capacities. And the lyre bird is like yeah. Yeah. the grail. <laughs> yeah. and and I, really feel, feel really free to I mean, the, the closest relatives to the starlings, which are about 120 species total, are uh, the new world mockingbirds and their relatives. So, so the capacity for mimicry uh, evolutionarily goes quite far back in this history, though not all starlings do it. And the other way to think about it is that starlings have more of their own stuff to say. Uh, so mimicry is a smaller part of their repertoire because they, uh, they have uh, starling stuff to do. And that's less true of lyrebird, uh, who is uh, mostly composing its repertoire from other species. Oh. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, starlings have a really high plasticity of behavior, so they have a lot going on. Yeah. Okay. So a, a question from Bruce uh, McIntyre. Do birds have perfect pitch? What do you think? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, starlings. I, I Do you know the answer to that? Well, I, I would say uh, I don't think they have names for pitches, so they're not going to say, oh, that's a that's a C sharp. Uh, uh -huh. but obviously. Um, in order to learn from conspecifics, they do have to uh, uh, match on, on frequency. And what's also interesting, of course, is that they have the individual motivation to do, uh, perhaps innovate, so they don't do it slavishly, but, they, but they, uh, they clearly have that capacity, I think. Right, and when you hear young birds learning, especially males in the fall, sometimes they'll already start learning their, their, uh, their song, their their adult song and they're very imperfect. So we can hear them working to get it right. And I hear that with Carmen when she is learning to mimic, she's her current project is the Buick's friend who's singing outside in the camellia outside of her window. And she, she practices, she gets it wrong and wrong. And then she eventually gets it right. So that's, that's social learning, right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, one of my uh, advisors, Bob Payne published a paper that a local, um, a local house finch uh, had learned from a canary that uh, one of the neighbors put out on her porch uh, so that the bird could sing outside. So even, it goes even from domestication into the wild, not just the, the other way. So um, a question from Susan, uh, is, uh, is Carmen a female and does she lay unfertilized eggs? Mm -hmm. Okay, Carmen is a female and it's really hard to tell, you know, unless you've done a lot of starling watching, there's not a lot of dimorphism between the feathers of the males and females. But in the breeding season, especially the males have these sort of punky feathers on their wings and their neck feathers are extra plumy. And uh oh, there's a cat on the loose. I, I only remembered to put the kitten away. This cat is very fat though. <laughs> Give me one second. I'm just gonna lock this fat cat up. Right, Delilah. <laughs> that is just that has been such a fascinating talk oh my god yeah. so rick do we don't want any tragedy here no leander rick i cannot resist uh chiming in here so does carmen have her personal song yeah so you know, okay, so what Carmen does is, and this is really interesting because a lot of passerin birds have vocalizations that are innate. If you if you get them when they're young, like I did Carmen, and they she's she wasn't really exposed to Carmen songs, and yet she sings the full range of of the typical female song. So it starts with a whistle, a whistle, and then her own repertoire of sounds, and then um another kind of rattling sound and then this crescendo whistle at the end and males add, add in this rattling song thing. So it, it goes, it, there's, there's just a, a formula for starling songs and she sings it, but she definitely has her own repertoire of mimicked sounds and she will integrate that into the typical starling um, pattern. It's fascinating. I hope that is, is, is that what your question? Yeah, was? that was my question. Um, uh, and I guess, I uh, would be great, Rick. And does does the signature song change with age? Well, uh, as uh, Lyanda pointed out, most of the these birds that learn their songs um, uh, 
learn or, or basically hit the target within the end of the first year, the first spring or the second year, and then stay that uh, the single song or the entire repertoire unchanged. There are, however, some birds that are much more open-ended and mimicry is a great way to get open-ended. That's probably why mimicry evolved at all because uh, there was either social choice or made choice for a very open or extreme repertoire. And if you keep learning other songs, you keep repertoire keeps growing, right? It's more uh, innovative and, 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 and novel. Um, but uh, another bird that learns their song uh, continuously throughout life is a canary, which is the wild species that the domestic canary came from. So canaries learn their uh, song uh, renewed every spring. They have a, a wild ones have a have a have a new uh, uh, rush of song innovation and learning. Um, it it from back in the nineties, I found out that that was actually associated with the origin of new neurons in the brain in song control areas, which was part of uh, the discovery uh, that uh, vertebrate brains can grow new neurons, which prior to that was not understood. So that, that fundamental uh, biological fact, which is now underlies you know, treatment for stroke and, and neurodegenerative disorders in humans was discovered in birdsong in, with exactly wow. this question in mind. Uh, and Liana's uh, just a quick final comment slash question, it might be crazy, but Liana, do you hear emotion when she improvises? Oh, <laughs> I know this is probably not a fair question and, you know, it's deeply personal, yeah. right? You. Um, I, I don't know about emotion. I mean, I, I think that she is definitely, um, she gets more excited when she hears certain music compared to other music. And I personally, I have to say, I'm not against it, you know, there, it, in science, there's this whole, oh my gosh, we don't want to anthropomorphize. And I actually think, you know, along, you know, 160 years ago, Darwin himself said that um, he didn't, in positing natural selection as a mechanism for evolution, he didn't see any difference in positive condition of morphological um, ecology and consciousness both like he didn't think it made any sense that there was a morphological continuation but consciousness somehow stopped with humans and he readily called animals peaceable calm happy whatever so um and, and i think that we've really really restricted the ways that we understand different intelligences by not allowing ourselves to just acknowledge that sometimes we recognize when an animal is in pain or is in distress or agitated. Um, at the same time, we don't want to over attribute. So when you say emotions, I pause for a minute, but I do think that there are times when she's engaged, when she's satisfied, when she's not agitated. Um, and a lot of that has to do with what's going on early. Thank you. Amanda, if I may, we have a, a great question from Professor Brown, who's president of the Mozart Society of America. He says the L at the end of stall, uh, sick as it was called in that initial note on the purchase in the ledger, makes it a diminutive in the German. Do you imagine that it was a baby, a chick starling when Mozart purchased star? Um, you know, I mean, I can look into it further, but as I understand it, that was a, um, a, that was one of the German common names for starling, Vogelstarl. And it meant little star because, and it's one of the reasons that we call starling starlings in their common name. And um, it's, they, they fly, they, they, they have pointed wings, pointed tails, pointed noses, and they look like little stars when they're in flight. And that's one theory of where the common name came from. And so um, it might've just been little star rather than baby starling. And Mozart was a decent naturalist. He knew something about, or he was interested in the natural world. And he certainly knew the common species name for the bird. And so later biographers reading that note would think that thought that he named the bird star based on that note, but he was really just labeling it according to the common name. So, um, to answer the question though, it's unlikely that it was a baby because one of the things that caused Mozart or urged uh, Mozart to purchase this particular bird was that it was singing the um, motif from the concerto. And birds, even gifted mimics like starlings are not able to mimic that something complex until they're several years old. And I, or rather several months old. And for many reasons, given the time of year, 
it was May. And so starlings are young in May, are born in May, even in, um, in now Austria, where Mozart was. And so it could not have been a baby. It would have had to be about a year old at that time to be singing at that level of complexity. So my conjecture is that it's a year old bird. And he died when um, three years later, so at about four years of age. Great question. Indeed. In August 1784, Emperor Joseph II decreed new burial regulations in Vienna for sanitation reasons, which later led to Mozart's quote unquote anonymous uh, shroud burial in 1791. By burying his dear star, the composer was probably breaking a law. And that's thanks to McIntyre, a great contribution. Yeah. It's true. People feel that Mozart was, uh, there's this myth that Mozart was buried in a pauper's grave and no one attended his funeral. And it's seen as this view that he was sort of spat upon by the city to which he gave so much. But as um, the commenter says, it's just, it was new regulations by Joseph II and of uh, for sanitation and for frugality. There was so much excess in the funeral um, processions before that. And these were changes that Mozart agreed with. So um, yeah, he was buried in a grave with about 10 other people, the shroud, throw some lye on top. And then in 10 years uh, time, they would reuse that plot for other people. We had a participant ask about the participatory mode, I think you were mentioning. Uh, do you remember that part of your talk? And could you go over that again, please? Okay, so what I was really saying is that um, what I initially thought in terms of Carmen's mimicry was participation in the household, that she was just picking up environmental sounds. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna tell you that this was gonna reflect poorly upon me, but the first environmental sound that she learned, she could say hi and hi honey and come here, but I heard her making this sound that went ee-oo, and I thought, what is that sound? And I finally figured out one day that it's the vacuum on the wine, you know, <laughs> you know how you, you have those vacuum that vacuums out the extra air. So her first mimicked environmental sound was, you know, associated with me hitting the bottle, <laughs> not really hitting the bottle, just sipping the Chardonnay. But anyway, um, I kind of thought that for a long time that she was just learning household sounds, but what turned out to be the actual case was that although she was learning to mimic household sounds, she wasn't just doing them along with us. She was doing them in anticipation of the sound that she knew was going to happen next. And that is the fascination of uh, the, just the complexity of the mindscape of this bird that, that she introduced to me. I mean, when I, uh, brought Starman, Carmen into the home as part of research for creating this book, I kind of thought I knew what was going to happen. You know, she was going to, she was going to mimic a lot and that was going to be interesting. She might learn the Starling or the Mozart motif and that would be great. Um, but instead she just really upended my sense of the possibilities of the infinity of intelligences that uh, surround us in the beyond human world. So that idea of, and, and this is, is little understood in the literature, little researched in the literature, because it's something that you can't figure out just hanging out with a bird in a lab, but it just takes months of sort of living day in and day out to finally figure out the pattern that she's not just singing along or not just singing your favorite songs. She's listening to you open the microwave door. And then before the beeps come, she's making the beeps. She's anticipating what's gonna happen next. She's just there waiting to say, I'm here. I know it's going to happen. And here it is. It's wonderful. One of the last questions, does Carmen communicate intelligently with other species? So we know you have cats, for instance, does she talk with the cat, to the cat, at the cat? Well, she mimics the cat. So she, when she sees the cat, she does meow because she knows the cat's going to meow. And as I said, she has this anticipatory relationship with life. But um, one of the reasons that she's not releasable to the wild, in addition to not knowing how to fend for herself and not knowing the uh, com complicated star starling social networks is that she thinks cats are her friends. 
So I don't let the cats out when Carmen is flying around just because sometimes you, you can see the instinct coming over them and they're just, the arm is, they know they're not supposed to kill stuff that lives in the house, but sometimes the instinct is just, you know, one of these days it, it, it would go awry. So the thing that does happen though, is when one of the cats goes to the aviary and sits on it's the aviary goes from the ceiling all the way to the floor and the cat will go up to the wire, put their noses right up to the wire and Carmen will come and put her bill right next to their nose, right next to it. And they'll maybe swat at her and she just jumps back about two inches. And then, so, so they socialize together. I mean, I think the cats just want to kill her, but Carmen thinks, oh, something is visiting me. Whenever anyone goes to Carmen's aviary, she just comes right up to see them and looks right into their eyes and tilts their head. And she does that with the cats as well. And she might perceive that she's safe thanks to the aviary enclosure too. Oh, she does, comes. but I, I don't know what would happen if she, I, I, yeah. I don't trust her to know better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, other other questions. Did I miss any? We had people asking, uh, can you purchase an adult starling uh, as Mozart did? No. And someone else already <laughs> said it would be illegal. <laughs> Is that because they're non-native? So it, it's actually interesting. I mean, I. I do not recommend having a starling as a pet. They're very, very high maintenance, it takes a lot of work, but it is also illegal. In some states, you are able to get a license to have one as a pet. When I talked to our own um, Washington State Fish and Wildlife person um, and asked why, why we are allowed to, you know, with impunity, kill adult starlings, you know, without, without telling anyone it's fine, it's legal, it's even encouraged. Um, why can we not just have one in the house? And he said that he's, they are worried about people propagating them as pets. And it's kind of a silly worry because there are so many starlings and, you know, we kill lots of stones. We kill the you know, millions of starlings a year um, for agricultural um, protection, but it doesn't make a dent in the starling population. And so someone would have to release a heck of a lot of starlings in order for it to make any difference. And it's hard to imagine what the motive for doing that would be. So I'm not saying that I think it's a good idea for people to have pet, uh, pet starlings, but I don't think it makes sense for us to be able to, you know, kill them or whatever, and but not keep them as pets. But there is no, you know, legal starling trade out there. Yeah. You'll have to, you're on your own. <laughs> you want to get a starling. I thought it was especially interesting uh, in your book, how you you delved into the rather brutal ways in which uh, it's open season on starlings uh, and, and the various, I remember some of the, the harrowing stories you told of people uh, doing their, their bit, I suppose, to protect native species by, by killing off the starlings. And yet, one of the things I really gathered from, from your talk and your book was how doing so and uh, such a focus on eradicating them inures us to their own uh, special nature and this greater intelligence that we can gather and immerse ourselves in and with of, of these animals that are otherwise unwelcome here. They did come here at our own hand. It was someone who brought them over, the, the releasing them in the park, the Shakespearean story. And uh, I, it taught me to look, for instance, at the house sparrows outside nesting. You know, they, they have a, a beauty and a rhythm of their own life and it, that has value too. So thank you for that. Right, I mean, one of the things is, it's not either or, you know, one of the things that's beautiful about the complexity of human intelligence is that we can hold both of these things at one time. We can right. dislike starlings ecologically. We can understand that their presence is an ecological harm. And yet we can be inspired or um, by the interconnection that their consciousness invites and, and just by their even just by their beauty. So it's, it's, it's not one or the other. It's, we can, we can do all of these things at once. And that's one of the things I tried to do with this research was invite that kind of nuance. Great. Um, I guess, Rick, do you have any closing questions of your own? No, no, I, I, I enjoyed this thoroughly. And, uh, 
I'm uh, I'm uh, fascinated to see this new angle on understanding uh, uh, bird intelligence and uh, also the history of others who have uh, appreciated it as well. So uh, thanks Great. very much. Um, yeah, uh, so at this point, I want to say a big thank you to Leander and to Rick for this wonderful, wonderful um, event. And uh, we are wishing you the best for your new book and uh, uh, can't wait to read that too. And uh, continue to have fun with Carmen. It was so nice and generous of you to share, uh, share her sort of uh, flying around. And, uh, and I'm glad she decided to participate in today's session. <laughs> I want to thank everyone. Thank you for bearing with the uh, technological rockiness and also just the sort of, you know, awkwardness of the talking head way that this plat platform requires us to communicate. But the, the Q&A is always the most fun. And um, I'm just delighted to be part of the series. Again, I want to thank everyone so much for having me and for listening. And Professor Rick, thank you. You're a delight. I'm a fan of your work and it was so fun to be here with you. Yeah, uh, so thank you everyone for attending and talked, uh, thank you so much Ty and uh, Guy for helping making it all go very smoothly. So bye everyone.